You're watching World News Tonight on TVP World. I'm Aaron Darman. Coming up, how the Polish government plans to restore the rule of law after the country's Conservative Law and Justice Party predecessors. More on that in just a moment. But first, let's take a look at tonight's headlines. The United States has announced a new $250 million aid package for Kyiv. A surprising declaration of support for Kamala Harris's presidential bid from Russian President Vladimir Putin. And more than 10,000 people have received Polish citizenship this year. The Polish government is preparing a number of reforms of the judiciary. One of them is the separation of the position of the Justice Minister from that of the Attorney General. Today, Prime Minister Donald Tusk and Justice Minister Adam Bodnar discussed ways to bring back the rule of law in Poland with members of the judicial community. The Friday consultations of the Polish government with lawyers and legal experts were aimed at ensuring a smooth return of the rule of law in the country. We're not a revolutionary government. We've made a promise to ourselves, our citizens and our partners in the European Union that we will bring back the rule of law while keeping the best standards of a democratic state. The biggest controversy concerns the changes made by the previous Conservative government of the Law and Justice Party to the judiciary. According to Jakub Kocjan, a board member of an organization fighting for bringing back the rule of law in Poland, the reforms made by the Conservative government severely crippled the separation of powers. This institution, which is responsible for uh, nominating new judges, uh, it was since 2018 captured by politicians. And the result is that we have so-called neo-judges, so these judges which were nominated with political influence. The Law and Justice Party also joined together the positions of the Justice Minister and Attorney General, which gathered a lot of criticism from the legal community. The new central liberal ruling coalition wants to reverse that decision. We have legislative reforms on the way. Our government is on the home stretch of adopting the bill separating the offices of the Minister of Justice and the Attorney General. Some of the initial changes made by the current administration have already unblocked more than 6 billion euro of EU funds for Poland. More should be on their way, along with the latest reforms. Poland's main opposition party, Law and Justice, has received a significantly smaller return of the costs of its political campaign. The party lost more than 10 million złoty, or about 2.5 million euro, due to irregularities in its financial report. Party officials are outraged, but that's not where the trouble ends for the group. The head of the Law and Justice Parliamentary Club, Mariusz Błaszczak, announced on Friday that his party has no intention of accepting the severe cuts to its funding. We will file an appeal to the Supreme Court today. We will appeal the decision of the National Electoral Commission. The Commission, or PKW, rejected the Conservative Party's financial report at the end of August. PKW argued that the Law and Justice Party mishandled about 850,000 euro of public funds in order to boost its political campaign. Since the results of the elections transfer to the amount of state subsidies received by the party, the Law and Justice was penalized with a loss of 2.5 million euro. This amount will also be taken from its yearly budget for the next three years. While members of the Conservative Party claim they're being politically targeted, MPs from other groups have a different opinion on the matter. They were using um, public money to, to take advantage of other parties uh, in these uh, elections we took last year in Poland. And right now, uh, the party is so-called law injustice is uh, experiencing how the law is working and the justice is uh, being applied for them. Another consequence of the rejection of the report is that the main opposition party could lose all of its state subsidies for the next three years. 
While a party of this size has never lost all of its state funding before, the loss of subsidies itself is not an unprecedented situation. Several parties lost some or all of their subsidies in the past, including the Together Party. Uh, those regulations should apply to everyone, even if it applies to my party, because uh, we live in a democratic society, uh, in a rule of law, uh, and this, those principles, they have to be obeyed and respected. At the end of August, the Polish Electoral Commission said that the final decision on the possible loss of all state subsidies by the Law and Justice Party should be taken in about a month. I've reached out to the Commission today, but they said that they haven't set a date just yet, so it could take about a few weeks. From Warsaw, TVP World, Kazimierz Wyszek. The United States has announced another $250 million aid package for Kyiv. Defence ministers of the Rammstein Group met in Germany today to discuss further support for Ukraine. Zelensky, who attended the meeting, is pressuring allies to allow long-range strikes against Russia. Ramstein Air Base, Germany. This is where Kyiv's allies meet to coordinate ongoing donation of military aid to Ukraine. We have a special guest here with us today, President Zelensky. Zelensky's latest visit to Ramstein is no coincidence. After the recent deadly pounding of Ukraine cities by Russian missiles, Kyiv is even more determined to pressure its allies to allow it to strike Russia. We need to have this long-range capability not only on the occupied territory of Ukraine but also on the Russian territory, yes, so that Russia is motivated to seek peace. Another difficulty Kyiv is facing is a shortage of missiles. More support was announced today. An additional $250 million security assistance package for Ukraine. It will surge more capabilities to meet Ukraine's evolving requirements and will deliver them at the speed of war. As part of his visit, Volodymyr Zelensky sat down for closed-door talks with the German Chancellor. Berlin has announced more howitzers for Kyiv. Air defense remains the focus of German military support for Ukraine. As you know, Germany has already delivered three Patriot systems from its own stocks to Ukraine and shared a large number of missiles and spare parts. I want to be sure that, uh, of course, Ukrainians uh, will receive more munition, more missiles. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, I'm not so sure that uh, we will see a revolution uh, in this uh, support. An historic new bilateral security agreement. Zelensky is planning to visit the United States later this month to present a victory plan to President Biden. But victory is nowhere in sight as of today. Ukraine's Kursk incursion has failed to divert Russian forces from eastern Ukraine, where the Russians are advancing. And for more, let's go live now to Kyiv to our correspondent Oz Katerji. Good evening, Oz. How has the Ramstein meeting been received in Ukraine? Well, it's going to be a, a, a mixed blessing here in Ukraine. With regards to the Kiev, uh, with sorry, the Ramstein contact group, um, Zelensky will have been hoping for more. Uh, let's start with the positive: this 250 million uh, US dollar aid package. They'll be pleased with that. Uh, the new howitzers uh, announced by Germany, the smaller smaller aid package by Canada. They'll be pleased with that. What they won't be pleased with is Washington still refusing to permit Ukraine the ability to use those long-range weapons that they have in their arsenal. Not many, but they have some, like the ATACMS missiles, uh, to use those to target Russian air bases. We've seen those Russian air bases uh, kill lots of people this week in Ukraine alone. Uh, and you, Kiev is insisting, Zelensky is insisting, uh, that they be allowed to use these weapons to prevent attacks like this from happening. You know, it's one thing for, for the pencil pushers in Washington to say something, but Kiev feels very differently about it because... Their people are dying day in, day out. So there is a difference in urgency uh, between Kiev and Washington that has not been uh, sort of uh, alleviated by this meeting and probably won't be alleviated uh, by the Zelensky's trip to uh, Washington later in the month. Now, looking at the bad stuff, Zelensky again is bringing up the fact 
that, that Ukraine has not been given the air defenses that have been pledged for it. It's one thing to pledge something, it's another to send it. Uh, Zelensky made very pointed that there is a significant amount of air defense capabilities that have been pledged to Ukraine that have not yet been sent. So he's urging his allies to get to get together and, and sort that out and expedite those deliveries because they're needed in Ukraine now, particularly as the autumn is, is setting in uh, and the winter months will be uh, hitting uh, very, very soon as well. Now, the, again, the biggest point is, is uh, Ukraine feels that the Kursk operation shows that Russia's red lines are meaningless. Zelensky himself said at the Ramstein meeting today, uh, Russia's attempt to draw red lines simply do not work. Uh, but Washington is not taking the lead from this. It's not uh, looking at the Kursk offensive and seeing this proves that uh, the escalation worry is not, not a big concern and we can allow the Ukrainians to use these weapons inside Russian territory. We've already got Western tanks rolling into Russia. Why shouldn't these long-range missiles be used? Washington does not view it the same way. That was made perfectly clear again by the Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin at Ramstein today. Kiev will be hoping that diplomacy... Uh, will try and slowly change Washington's mind. But so far, Washington isn't budging. Thank you, Oz. Oz Katerji, our Ukraine correspondent from Kyiv. A Polish court has ordered the arrest of three Belarusian officials. They stand accused of forcing a plane carrying a dissident to land on Belarusian territory back in 2021. The Belarusian officials stand accused of illegally taking control of an aircraft, as well as of detaining the crew and passengers. The incident took place in May 2021. In May 2021, Roman Protasevich, a well-known Belarusian blogger, was traveling from Greece to Lithuania on a Ryanair plane registered in Poland. In Belarusian airspace, the plane was intercepted under the false pretense of there being a bomb on board. It was forced to land, after which Roman Pratasevich was arrested along with his girlfriend. The Polish court has ordered the arrest of the head of a Belarusian air traffic control at the time, the head of Minsk air traffic control and a high-ranking Belarusian KGB official. The defection of one of the air traffic controllers, present in Minsk Tower that day to Poland, greatly aided the investigation. The investigation into the case was conducted with the help of Eurojust, the European Union's Agency for Criminal Justice Cooperation. We organized uh, five uh, coordination meetings at Eurojust, uh, where prosecutors and uh, investigators of uh, respective countries had gathered here uh, in The Hague in order to discuss the uh, uh, investigations, in, uh, in order to discuss the strategy of the investigation. The interception of the Ryanair flight significantly worsened the relations between Warsaw and Minsk. After the hijacking of the Ryanair flight and the kidnapping of Pratasevich and his girlfriend, additional sanctions against Lukashenko were introduced. This led Lukashenko to open the Pandora box to begin the migrant crisis on the borders with Poland, Lithuania and Latvia, which has been going on for three years now. Following his arrest, Roman Protasiewicz repeatedly issued pro-government statements and was spared a jail sentence. His girlfriend, Sofia Sapiega, has been allowed to return to her home in Russia. Berlin has been looking to counter illegal arrivals after the killing of three people by a Syrian man who came to Germany. A recent comment by Germany's Migration Commissioner suggested that the country could take over the UK's unsuccessful plan to send asylum seekers to Rwanda, but that seems unlikely. Those migrants who cross into the European Union through Belarus could be sent to Rwanda to have their asylum requests processed. That's the latest proposal by Germany's Migration Agreements Commissioner Joachim Stamp. Speaking for German television Welt, Stamp proposed that accommodation originally intended for people deported from the UK could be utilized by Germany. Stamp is a member of the FDP, a junior coalition partner of Olaf Scholz's coalition. His idea has drawn some internal criticism. I have no clue why anybody would want to pick up one of the worst blunder that the Tories pursued while they were still in office. Isn't that obviously an idea that speaks cruelty? Recently, the country resumed the deportations of Afghan nationals. This came after a mass stabbing at a city festival in Zollingen last month that left three people dead. 
The suspect, a Syrian linked to the Islamic State, came to Germany in 2022. It is a clear sign that anyone who commits criminal offenses cannot count on us not deporting them, but that we will look for ways to do so. The German government has been under pressure to tackle illegal migration also after the recent successes of the anti-immigrant AFD party in state elections. Who is the ideal US president according to the Kremlin? Well, Russian President Vladimir Putin caused quite a stir when during a panel meeting in Vladivostok he picked the Democrat candidate Kamala Harris as his favourite. The jury is up on whether this is mockery or deception, but it might be an element of Russia's attempt to influence the result of the upcoming presidential elections in the U.S. Our favorite was the acting president, Mr. Biden. He's been taken out of the race, but he advised all his supporters to support Mrs. Harris. That's what we'll do. We'll support her as well. As Putin is typically seen as a supporter of Donald Trump's presidency, such words of support might sound like a joke. But it may also be a move to disrupt the upcoming elections in November. He knows perfectly that this is kind of a red flag for democratic voters, simply because they would not want to have a president who would be the person that uh, the Russians would want. When inquired about the speech, Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov did not dispel doubts about Putin's surprising endorsement. Perhaps those who are interested in this abroad should try to figure it out by themselves. Let's not deprive them of this opportunity. With the US presidential election just two months away, sowing confusion among American voters might be the result that the Kremlin wants. Russia is predominantly interested not really in the president's person, but is interested mostly in steering the pot in the US. Russia is no stranger when it comes to meddling with the opinions of American voters. Its interference in the 2016 and 2020 presidential elections has been well documented. He has no empathy. These elections are said to be no different. On Thursday, the US Attorney General announced a crackdown on Tenet Media, an outlet that was to be sponsored by the Kremlin and which has been spreading Russian disinformation. We allege that as part of that effort, RT and its employees, including the defendants, implemented a nearly $10 million scheme to fund and direct a Tennessee-based company. This is why some experts warn that not all the words of Russian officials should be taken at face value. In the end, it's a choice for the people of America to make. People of America will make their choice on the 5th of November. But first, Vice President Kamala Harris and former President Donald Trump will take the debate stage on Tuesday of next. More than 10,000 people have become Polish citizens already this year. It's all part of a larger trend with a flurry of citizenship applications in Poland, especially after the outbreak of the war in Ukraine. Hollywood star Jesse Eisenberg revealed that he has filled all the paperwork to become a Polish national and is waiting for the final decision on being granted Polish citizenship. The actor, who is of Polish descent, last year shot his film A Real Pain, set in Poland. But without Polish roots, it's also possible to become a Polish national. You just need to have permanent residence, a job permit and sufficient Polish language competencies. Alternatively, you can lodge a formal request to the Polish president. The president can also grant Polish uh, uh, citizenship and this is a very formal procedure where the president is actually free and unlimited uh, uh, to decide on whom he will bestow that. Everyone who holds Polish citizenship is eligible to obtain a Polish passport, which opens the visa-free door to almost 130 countries. In the global passport power rank, Poland sits in the fourth place, but becoming a Polish citizen grants you more rights within the country. Also, you can vote, and that's an amazing thing which I enjoyed in the last elections. I, like, you live in a country and you want to influence what's happening around you, and without it you, don't, you cannot, but, but with it you can finally have a say. Yet, being handed Polish citizenship is not just about the formalities. 
emotionally things change you sort of suddenly very much feel sort of part of the fabric of the country and you think okay so you know this is where I am and this is who I am now um, even though you sort of have that emotional connection but now it feels a little bit more solid looking at the figures one can easily notice is that the war in Ukraine prompted a precipitous surge in the number of foreign nationals turning Polish the vast majority of them hail from the east the three biggest groups, it's uh, the Ukrainians as number one, the Belarusians as number two, citizens of Belarus. But again, we should distinguish between the citizens of Belarus who see themselves as ethnically Belarusian and Poles living as a minority in Belarus who decide to come back to Poland. But apart from people who originate from Ukraine or Belarus, there is also a fair share of people coming from other countries such as Russia, Vietnam or Armenia. However, there are also instances of people who are citizens of Yemen, the Gambia or Sao Tome and Principe, and they have also become Poles. The holiday season in Brussels is coming to an end, and next week the makeup of the new European Commission will be announced. Ursula von der Leyen's team will almost immediately face a litany of problems. Sluggish growth in the European Union, political weakness in France and Germany, two of the EU's biggest economies, the ongoing war in Ukraine and many others. So how will the Commission tackle the challenges? Well, here to discuss this issue with us is Eric Nielsen, the Group Chief Economist at Unicredit. Good evening, Eric. Good evening. Thank you so much for your time. And let's start with the big players now. So the European Union's new Executive Commission and newly elected Parliament are starting their new term. What are the top challenges they should be addressing? Well, there are very many, um, uh, and as you have seen uh, from uh, from various commentators, uh, they range from the uh, imminent discussion of uh, the fiscal rules, where France is, seems to be in trouble, uh, but it also goes, of course, uh, more importantly, in many ways, to the to the global issues that which are facing Europe now. Uh, uh, this is the uh, starting with the issues between the US and China, it's issues of climate change, and as you mentioned in your, in your introduction, the, the issue of, uh, of, of the war in Ukraine and how Europe reacts and, and yeah, reacts to it. We're seeing increasing paralysis in the EU's top economies. I also mentioned that in the intro, France and Germany. To what extent is this going to hamper any ambitious economic policy by the Commission? Let's be blunt. Uh, it's devastating. There is a, a. It's as you as you correctly sort of, of, of said in the introduction. There's a lot to be said about the, the European Commission and the incoming overall Commission under von der Leyen's leadership. Uh, we don't know whether the Commission is going as is being appointed is going to be uh, uh, approved by the European Parliament. So my, first of all, let's, let's recognize there's a couple of months at least to go until it's in place and up and running. But the key point here is that nothing really gets done in Europe without German and French leadership. This is the reality of it. The power ultimately sits in the European capitals and uh, the two biggest economies, as you correctly said, Germany and France, are both uh, in some various degrees of political uh, no man's land. So uh, without Paris and, 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 uh, and uh, Berlin working properly and at full speed and in sync, which they don't do either now, um, there's so little really Europe can do, unfortunately. If we look at Germany, for example, I mean, there's been much talk about the lack of competitiveness and innovation, the inability to turn flagships like Volkswagen around. Is Germany again the sick man of Europe? Um, I don't like the term, but uh, but if you mean it in the way that is discussed in the in the media, generally speaking, lower growth than the average and uh, dragging down growth generally. The answer is yes. Um, but let me say, I don't think it's fair to, uh, or it's correct to pin it on the corporates per se. Volkswagen was in, have been in the news. Or it's an important issue. Uh, uh, but fundamentally, right, 
Germany runs a big current account surplus, means that they are, on normal standards or definitions, competitive. The problem is that domestic demand has not picked up for five years. Domestic demand in Germany today, in level terms, is the same as in 2019. And that has to do with a whole lot of things, including macroeconomic policies, the, the, the budget, uh, the debt break, and of course, monetary policies to some extent. Well, when we talk about monetary policy or indeed the EU economy, it has stagnated for months. It seems no one's really addressing the issue, including the European Central Bank, which has been slow to respond with cutting interest rates to spur growth. How are the financial markets responding to this? Well, the uh, European financial markets have been, uh, uh, so maybe you could say surprisingly well behaved uh, for an economy, the Eurozone economy, which have, has, as, as we talked about, not grown at all in terms of domestic demand for five years. But that's because equity markets, stock markets in Europe are driven to a very large extent by America. And America is doing very well uh, in terms of economic terms, not politically maybe, but, it, but in terms of, of, of economic uh, growth. So, so that has driven or pulled along European equities to a, to a significant extent. And in fixed income markets, where most people probably would have anticipated that this type of growth, uh, poor growth outlook, would have constrained the fixed income markets, and particularly when it comes to the sovereign spreads between, say, Germany and Italy, that has also behaved amazingly well. I mean, we have spreads in the vicinity of 150 basis points, and we, in the good old days, thought that 200 was a was an okay number. So it, it's really... Uh, remarkable, but we can talk more about this in it. This has much more to do with with fundamentally good economic policies in Italy than it has to do with Europe, and, and it has to do with the central bank's policy setup, obviously. You mentioned America there. Let's talk about that. In just over two months, they'll have a new president. And in the US, we've seen protectionism on the rise. We've seen Republican candidate Donald Trump vowing to raise tariffs on all imports. What should the EU's response be? Um, first of all, uh, uh, they won't have a new president uh, until January. So we have, a, we have two months more than you indicated. Uh, and, uh, and hopefully we have, well, we will have by then. Um, it's it's tough to say. Uh, I mean, but you put your what the European response should be. But you put your finger on exactly the right spot. That if Donald Trump wins, the at least he promises to go down further this road of protectionism, or nationalism, which uh, he had in his previous uh, period as president. And as to be honest, uh, Joe Biden has also done to. A significant extent, not on terrorists, but on on various protection measures, the famous IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, really is to a large extent. It's a climate change act, but it's it's more than an inflation reduction act, and it is a protectionist act, a industrial policy. Um, so, um, what the next president does or does not do, I don't know, uh, and I and I'm hesitant to say what the response should be, because the worst thing you can imagine for global growth and European growth is tit for tat. That said, it's an illusion to think politically, I think, that America, say under Donald Trump, can raise taxes on import from Europe by the 20% he has suggested without Europe taking countermeasures and probably retaliatory measures. And I would say with a very high probability that certainly China would do so. So it's so it's it's a it's a very very dangerous outlook for the global economy under a Donald Trump, without a shade of a doubt. And you're very right. Forgive me. Voters go to the polls in two months. A new president uh, will be in place by January. Bill Clinton famously said, "The economy stupid." It seems these days it's a little bit politics stupid. Do you feel like politics is killing globalization as we know it? Yeah, I think that's a good way of putting it. To be honest, um, so it's um, uh, let me say first on with regard to the to the American economy. By any measure, uh, it's doing it has been doing during the last four years fantastically well. 
in terms of job, job creation and growth. Uh, and the only really imbalance in the American economy is the fiscal deficit, which is way too high. Uh, we can discuss whether that's sustainable or not, but it is. But that's the big uh, uh, imbalance. And strangely enough, that is not being discussed whatsoever, to my knowledge, in the campaign. That, you know, and the reason, of course, is that both candidates are promising fiscal policy measures, which is going to, on all serious estimates, expand the deficit a bit, uh, a bit if it's Kamala Harris, potentially by a lot if it is Donald Trump. And this is sort of independent research that we can talk about, but it's, and we're going to discuss how much they get to do, but it's, but none of them are campaigning, is campaigning on a platform of reducing the deficit, right? So it's, but, but, but the economy is not doing well. However, the politics of it has not played the same way. If you, the survey suggests that big groups of, of the population does not feel that they are doing so well. And, and this comes back, back, in my opinion, to probably the single biggest issue between us economists and the politics of the place of the post-inflation period we have. We economists are happy that inflation has come back to broadly where it came from. But a big part of the population is concerned, and rightly so, that the price levels remain high. And that translates then into the so-called uh, cost of living crisis, and that makes people unhappy, and that unhappy, and that is probably to a large extent what drives the uh, discontent and the and the politics of flirting or even driving towards the extreme right uh, in America, but also in Europe, in many countries in Europe, right? And you know of this in Poland as well, right? Eric Nelson, the Group Chief Economist at UniCredit. Thank you again for your time. Thanks for having me. And that's World News tonight. Do stay with us here on TVP World. I'm Aaron Darman. Good night.